All right, fixed. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the wait. Seems we have quite a few people waiting this time. That's awesome. Uh, hello and welcome to the belated but still here. I got to get the name right every time I say it. The uh, Roach Crossing Weekly General Live Stream, November 11th, 2021. Uh, after some uh, webcam issues uh, that I was just having. Surprisingly, uh, apparently to fix this, uh, somehow I had turned it off in this separate MSI manager thing. There is a single toggleable thing for webcam on and off. And if you run system troubleshooting and all that other stuff, it uh, won't actually come up through that. So somehow that got turned off. So here I am. Here we are. Here we go. Um, I have actually been chipping away at emails and whatnot throughout the day. So that means that this particular live stream, I will actually be uh, working on adding content to the website. Yeah, big surprise. Um so we're going to be working on adding some new species pages, new species profiles with information and all that fun stuff. I have this fan on because as the, uh, as the season goes on, uh, this room has been getting very toasty despite uh, being my comfortable office space. Uh, as, as you can see, there are a lot of things running. And, of course, the heat from the furnace and blah, blah, blah being on. Halfway through a moth light media video on the bike hall seal when you started. No, I couldn't have waited, Will. I, I couldn't have. I had to. Uh, especially with so many people here. This is exciting. I don't know what it is. This uh, this week, last week, things were a bit slow to start. Uh, maybe it is uh, um, uh, the efforts of Mr. Uh, Junkai, perhaps, or maybe uh, some other links that have been shared. But... It's uh, good to be present with everybody. Uh, I, I have some things I want to show off. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. I have some things I want to show off um, soon. I'm also kind of hungry. I haven't eaten much today. Will and I were out running errands and stuff all day and then getting back home and taking the bugs and having Will move everything around was very tiring for me. Um, lots of goodies came in. It is a comfy chat. I think it'll it'll stay comfy and perhaps get comfier over time, assuming my grotesqueness doesn't scare uh, newbies and whatnot away. And it's good to see everybody. I think Victor wants to go out, so I'm going to go let him out and throw away some stuff um, and then dive into making some species profiles. Come on, baby. You got to go outside? Yeah? Would you like to know see lamb chop? So if it hadn't been for Veterans Day today, I would probably be under a pile of boxes right now, all the stuff that's supposed to be coming in. Apparently, Ian, before I start playing Mesh. Ah, yes. Hello, Gene. I, um, I, uh, Gene B, I, I can't remember what, um, we'll call you that for now since I don't like using customer names and whatnot unless they have pre-approved it. But, um, show us the pack notas. Which ones? Uh, um... Uh, yeah, uh, you, Gene Beanie, you found out the hard way about the importance of ventilation for roaches, but at least, you know, they all recovered after you took the, the lid off of them. So that's good. That's, I think I mentioned I almost killed my whole pallid roach colony when I was in college because I had them in a, I had them, I had, they were like round snap lidded containers, um, kind of like the ones you usually see herps and stuff for sale at shows in. 
And uh, I had just one little strip of top ventilation on both of them that had a mesh on it. And I set the uh, Oxyhaloa Duista on top of the pallid roaches. And I think the room got a little too hot on like a late spring day. And like I came back and like they're just all f- dead on the dead on the bottom. It was like, so I just took the whole container outside and, just I can't remember if I put a fan over it or what exactly I did. I just remember panicking to get the lid off and just laying it air out, and they were all fine. Blue beanie jeans. Yeah, I recognize the little avatar and whatnot. The other one who managed to asphyxiate them. At least it wasn't anything really rare um, or like uh, Alan and I drying out countless Mermecobleta and uh, Compsodes and whatnot on our trips. So... Um, yeah, I'm, uh, let's see, yeah, the chat's popping. I don't know what, I don't know what pack notas you want to see. I just have the, the Marginata Peregrina, the Sinuata Flaviventris, and then the Esculca, which I checked on, or rather, I, no, I, I checked on them. I've, I've been seeing, um, dead adults, uh, with some fungus emerging from the, I don't think it's entomophagus. I think they die, and then the fungus sort of overtook them. And I was like, what? Why is this happening? Because I haven't sent like my other pack notas. So I had Will go through and pick out all the adults and pupil cells and stuff like that. And there were not as many as I was hoping to have found. Um, so what I think what was happening is since I put a big layer of leaves at the bottom and there were no, you know, mixed size larvae off the bat to shred that and turn it into frass pellets that the adults were sort of going down for their various purposes and sort of getting stuck in the leaf leaf litter layer and then you know by the time they managed to get up or out you know they were in bad shape so anyway so that's all reconfigured and redone there's like i don't know probably about 15 adults emerge and not emerge from their pupil cells so i'm sweating a little bit but uh, I went through mixing that lobster compost stuff and a bunch of wood pellets to make it super airy. And I tore out, shredded all the leaves into bits. And so now things can get down and back up. You know, unlike the other pack notas where it's just a writhing horde of mixed size uh, individuals and they just turn the uh, substrate into um, uh, pellets immediately and the adults can lay in that and bore into it. So. Yeah, good cross ventilation. You know, I've been doing like I've been doing mostly top ventilation, but that's because I have foregone the uh, practicality of plastic bins other than critter keepers for just rows and rows of tanks, which is what I would like to continue doing. I just infest my house with tanks full of cockroaches. Um, so, but you know, at least the the time that the uh, city inspector came by. It was very impressed. He was like, we were, not a, we were not anticipating things to be like this. And I was like, yeah, I know. So, um, yeah, so stuff today, stuff in general, bunch of bugs, always a bunch of bugs coming in from all directions, more so this week than many previous weeks. I went a little crazy over the weekend getting into a bunch of things, but I'm pretty happy about it. You know, I made some good connections with some people who um, – who have been to re- reconnected with a couple of people, made some new connections with people. Uh, so that's always half the fun of, you know, bugs is just meeting what other crazy people there are out there. Yeah. You know, on a, a, that, that was the life that I, that I lived before. Again, I went insane and decided to, in this economy, spend $20 each on uh, 10 gallon tanks and then an additional $15 for the lid. And then however much, you know, I have to put into making the gasket, seals and all that stuff for them but you know that's fine because i'm you know i'm in this for the the very long haul and i have big colonies and i have my established system for watering and all that other stuff going on so it's worth it in my eyes but i also acknowledge that i am absolutely crazy (laughs) so um but yeah let's see stuff that's happened the past week, a uh, bunch of orders, Monday, Tuesday, uh, Will and I felt the, the, the brunt of that. Um, Remechophilus would be easier to keep them Remechoblad. You know, I think Remechobladus can be easier. A couple people here, um, especially uh, Will, Nature Man 494 
really into ant crickets and you know i know a couple people who have given it a good effort myself included and nobody seems to be able to get a tj got babies i think once but nobody's really been able to get like a culture going for some reason which is weird because other ant commensals you can you know like the white ant springtails and the uh uh, platyarthrus iacensis you can just dump random food in there it's just basically they just adapted to not get eaten by the ants and just overall uh, generalist scavengers or whatever in the ant nests so um yeah we tried to i had a small group of of ant crickets from this uh arizona trip and I had one die. I threw them in with white ant springtails. I thought maybe they could be like predatory. They'd eat the exuvia or something. It'd give them more protein or what have you. And that didn't do so well. But also that, that white ant colony oh, that's in the other room um, isn't doing as well as the one last year. I think combination of factors going off on another tangent here was last year when Will and I put the white ant springtail colony together, I also threw in um, a couple of crab, crab like rove beetles from outside. I thought, oh yeah, I love these. These are cool. And the the container went through a phase where there was a fungal bloom from the dog food and what have you. But the crab like rove beetles ate all that and they bred. They did really well in there, so they cleared all that out. And then over time, the white ant springtails, which seemed to directly eat the dog food and stuff. Um, they really boomed and then they just kept going until they died out over the summer in that container. Um, so I, I think that part of the reason why the white ants are not through the roof right now is because I didn't add crab like rogue beetles to keep the fungus suppressed until the springtail numbers got really high. But they're doing fine. You know, I have enough for sale and all this stuff, so they're doing fine. But back to, back to ant crickets. So... Yeah, so something's missing. I don't know what it is that we could be missing from them, I any mean, other than, you know, the ants. Uh, <laughs> but it's got to be something simple and gimmicky, ventilation or diet or something like that, you know. But, yeah, the, the ant commensal cockroaches. Compsodes did fine. Schwartzai did fine. Everybody has Schwartzai right now. Well, thank you, Edward. See if you can successfully keep weevils. What weevils, Gene? The, um, uh, what's that genus that Will got me some of? Rice weevil. The, uh, Cytophilus horizi, um, or something else. Yeah, grain weevils. Funny, because Will, uh, and also, hi, some eggs. I have to say hi to you every time because you are here every time, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, hitchhiking grain weevils. Uh, Will, Nature Man for whatever, um, he, uh, he has, he started a colony of rice weevils he found when he was working his exterminator job, and so we've been culturing those, uh, but they're, they're nifty, you know, and also apparently there's a, several different species and they hybridize and all this stuff. Uh, but we, I guess it's, you know, stuff that feeds on grains is just so easy to keep. It's just kind of like, well, might as well collect them if you find them and keep them going. And yeah, Alan with the, the comp sodies. Yeah, you know, actually, the Platyarthrus Hoffman's eggy I found in my front yard. They're where the Tetramorium ants make their colonies, but only after the ants have moved out. So I wonder if maybe that's what happened there. But, yeah, I mean, we found those Compsodes under bark in Arizona on the first trip where we, you found, like, one female or something. So, I mean, they, they get around. Maybe they live just in, like, places where there's excess food and nutrients and whatnot that they can just sort of, like, bum around and not get eaten by other things for a while. <sighs> yeah, Tyler, if you collect a good group of them, um, I'd be interested in swapping you for some, Ellen, or, uh, or uh, <laughs> so many people here. It's great. Some be mixed up names. Uh, Will might swap you for them, too. I mean, I figure the uh, northern ones maybe need a diapause or something weird like that. Maybe they don't. I don't know, since they live in ant colonies. Um, but, yeah, I, I figure it'd be easier to just work with a southern arid species. You know, it's probably less complex 
healthcare requirements and whatnot. Jean, I found and uh, bought a bag of mixed chicken feed. I give free choice to the dubias and found little weevils chilling in there. Uh, are you also sure that they're weevils? Because there, there's all those. There's like tons of different little darkling beetles that can be found in feed like that too. But they could be weevils because apparently, according to Will, those are fairly common in places too. We have hit. Oh, and there it goes. We hit ten people. In the live stream for a second there, that was thrilling. Oh boy, wait till we get, wait till we consistently get into double digits. Hope, hopeful, wishful thinking here. Um, on the topic of of pest insects that get into feed, so Will and I were running errands today. Uh, we went to Menards, and you know, all the with the supply chain issues and stuff, everybody's getting low on on everything. Sylvanid, Sylvanid. Let's see. Tyler would know as a, as an expert. Yeah, so or Sylvanity. I think that's that's what um Will and I were finding today. In addition to the primary find, um, where the little Sylvanids, um, ooh, everybody presses like at the same time. If everybody wants to do that, go right ahead and press like. I don't even know how to how to do that because I am completely inept at this. Um, but anyways, um. Sylvanids in the feed. Anyway, so Will and, I, Will and I went to Menards, and we're shopping around for... Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for pressing like. Uh, we were shopping around for miscellaneous supplies, and I need to get more of my really crappy, low-quality dog food that I feed everything from, you know, lobster roaches to rhino roaches to fancy, expensive isopods, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so... Uh, we'll, Usually there's, you know, there's the, the cheap dog food, the big stacked pile of it on the end caps, but they've been completely out of, you know, all that stuff. Everything's looking bare. There's 10 people again. Um, and so all we had to go for, like, the dog food bags that were, like, down on the very bottom shelf in contact with the floor. There's all kinds of debris. The places you don't want to, like, look for too long because you realize how gross big box stores are. Um Hey, Daniel, you saw a German today. Yeah, Sepo Roach Trap. I mean, I'm, I'm getting a colony from um, Mark Mayer sending me back some from that Alexandria, Virginia uh, stock. But, you know, I I might make a super line cross of them, German people. Um, anyways, back to the story because this, is, this, was, this was the highlight of today. So we, we go to move the bags or I go to move the bags to pick up um, stuff. And all these little shiny beetles fell out. And I'm looking, I was like, what the heck? And then Will eventually came over. We're both looking at them and we're like, these are cool, but we don't know what they are. So like we don't nest and we don't have any collecting gear. We're not we're in a menards. And so we're just sort of like looking at them like, what are we gonna do? So we you know, I load up the one bag that didn't look as infested, and Will Will had the um the beetle between his fingers and it was biting him or whatever and looking at it. We're, we're in the, the checkout um, waiting to buy all my other stuff. And Will's like, looks up. It was red legged hand beetles. And we were just both like, oh. and then reading on the, you know, the, the, the biology and whatnot and how easy they are. And then, you know, the larvae is really weird looking at all this stuff. And we were just like, okay, we, we, we gotta, we gotta go back. So we take all the stuff out to the car, load it up. Grab one of the containers we bought at the GFS, which, by the way, that's also experiencing supply shortages. Um, the fact that GFS didn't have a lot of plastic containers and stuff. So I ended up with a bunch of 32-ounce cups with no lids and a bunch of those little 4-ounce deli cup lids but no cups. I mean, I had plenty of stuff sitting in the garage and whatnot here. But still, it was like, this is annoying. So we walk, <laughs> we walk into the Menards with just an empty 32-ounce cup um, and go all the way back to the dog food section and we're sitting there moving the bags of dog food and catching all of these little red-legged hand beetles uh and then you know and once we caught i think it was maybe like a dozen or whatever and you know saw some of them trying to make we're like okay we got enough so i just i just sort of like hold on to the cup and walk through the menards and nobody seemed to really pay any attention then we get to like the final trial which is going by all the checkouts and stuff so like go off to the side and start walking i'm just sort of like holding it in a way that makes it look like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything wrong. And just, <laughs> I just walk out of the Menards. I don't think anybody like looked at us or anything like that. And there's a lot of people there. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, usually I have something in my car. We had a, we had the, a pooter with us, but it got crushed, uh, 
Uh, I, I, I don't know if I want to monetize eventually, but it had a very inappropriate uh, name that Will and I had given this particular pooter, uh, named after a uh, pseudoscorpion genus, uh, Pseudogarapus. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, yeah, so they are just the coolest things for being, you know, apparently a pest beetle and apparently one that is increasing in importance lately. So here, here they are, red-legged hand beetles. And again, I still don't know if this mirrors the, the stuff that I show, but here's the culture on the dog food uh, that, that we had gotten. And this is interesting. All of them, this is a side that touches a uh, heat mat, but it seems like there there's a lot of them in this little, in the, the lower corner here. But, you know, seeing them in the store, I thought like, oh, cool, like shiny metallic beetles. This is awesome. But then seeing them outside, it was like, these are really cool for being a pest beetle. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the staff members just walked right past us while we were collecting and walking out with them. So anyway, so this is my, my brand new as of today, red-legged hand beetle culture. And then like Will and I went into kind of like Pokemon mode and like he was looking at all the other members of this genus that have been introduced and we're just like, wow, the red legged one, the red shouldered one. And then I found another one on Bug Guy that I can't remember. So it's like, ooh, we got to collect them all. And then looking, uh, uh, looking for other places to find them, thinking that like we drove by this spot that had like a dead raccoon on a fence, like right off of the main freeway, just like it had gotten caught on its neck somehow. It was just banging there and the skin was falling off or dangling there and the skin was falling off and just thinking like, huh, maybe there'd be something there if we went back in the spring. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is the find of the day, these red-legged hand beetles. I, I'm quite enamored with them. And, you know, something that feeds on something that I have a ton of around anyways is always very welcome, especially something that feeds on just dog food with no supplemental care <laughs> is very uh, welcome. I wonder if they could be used as feeders if the larvae because they're they're very elongated. They don't seem to have much of a good defense mechanism. Uh, another one of the cool things you know about them was the fact that they make uh, the larvae make uh, silk chambers and beetles that make uh, another beetle that makes silk. So that was really cool. <laughs> Collecting entire genuses may be the death of me. I don't even know how many species are introduced in the. Uh, U.S. I just saw that there's three on bug guide. No, not Necrobius. Necrobia bug guide. Let's see what they say. How many species are three species in our area? All cosmopolitan and inventive. We have Necrobia rufipes, which is what we have, um, with the legs bright, bright reddish orange and whatnot. Necrodia violacea, similar to N. rufipes, but appendages dark. Ooh, variant. Um, the, and Necrobia ruficalis, which is the red-shouldered one. And all of them apparently feed on just misc foodstuffs and whatnot. So I, I feel like I've seen ruficalis before looking at these pictures. And then the, uh, the other one is called like the bone beetle. Cosmopolitan Blue Bone Beetle. I don't know why they couldn't just call it Blue Bone Beetle, but that seems pretty cool from the uh, bug, bug Guide pictures. So, hmm. Some eggs. Um, are the larvae easy to extract? Uh, I don't know. It seems like they... It was said that they bore into the food, which would you know make it seem like it would be very hard to collect them, but they might not do that behavior when they're on top of each other in a deli cup like that. But you know, we found a couple larvae while we were moving stuff around. You know, it was mostly adult beetles that we were seeing. So uh so yeah, that was the main excitement for today was um going and finding those red-legged hand beetles, just like, oh, cool, a culture or something out of the blue in November. This is great. So, um, again, again, this connection is unstable. Please wait while we try connecting. Dude, that's very strange. So if anybody's having stream issues, feel free to, to speak up. I'll see what I can do about that in the future. I did increase the bandwidth or something like that. I can't remember exactly what I did. Like I said, I'm I'm not completely technologically inept, uh, but I can. I am definitely not a tech 
wizard unless I look through a bunch of how-to FAQ guides and stuff. All right, seems like it's working fine for Gene. Good, all right. We got 11 people, so we're going to dive right into something that I'm dying to show because I was working with them today, and uh, they are really awesome. Uh, it's something I've, you know, it's not something completely novel new, but it's just something I'm very excited about having a good number of and whatnot. So these are, these little, little guys are Lanxoblata rudis, 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 I think called rudis. Uh, the, I don't even know what the common, the common name is. I'm so out of the loop with the ACS and all that, whatever, you know, just use the Latin. Um, Lanxoblata rudis. And they are super duper, duper flat. Especially the, re the the main reason why I brought them to show to this is this one right here. I think is freshly molted or probably within like the last couple of days, and so it's just like extremely flat. Like these other ones are probably going to molt soon. I don't know, maybe within like a week or two weeks or something. Probably a week, but this one is just like right tight to the bark there. So I have about maybe 30 of these ranging from about this size, this size to this size to the size that you see here. These are probably all females also, I would think, based on the, the size. Yeah, it looked like I was going to bite into it. It is kind of a tasty piece of bark. I think it's a weird, weird piece of cottonwood maybe, but um, these guys are pretty, how many meters thick? So it's, it's the actual exoskeleton is maybe only like 1, 1 1.5 millimeters. It's pretty thin. But the thing is they have all of their legs like sort of like crammed in underneath there. So there's, there's part – the overall appearance is, you know, especially towards the center is a little bit bowed upwards. But, um, oh, something seems to be getting these other ones to perk up a little bit. Uh, at least on that freshly molt, semi freshly molted one. So, oh, they're so cute. Little antennae are waving. Little white tipped antennae. <clears throat> um, so yeah, they they are just super flat as nymphs, and as adults, they're still pretty flat. But it's just it's not. They don't have the the adults are are solid colored. They look kind of like Ergola, uh, adult males, and so they don't they don't have the same appeal of being flat as a strip of bark and also looking like a strip of bark. So, uh, yeah, so the, the hope is I, I had them in, they were actually, they were up here in one of these containers. You can see the one where that, that's missing from where they were. Um, I guess I'll keep holding them here. So I had them up there, uh, to, to pay extra special close attention to them because apparently people are not doing very well with them in the U S or anywhere, I guess. Um, and then I was, you know, I was adding some more containers. I had a couple, like one or two adults that had kind of wonky molts, and I've lost just a handful out of the ones that I've gotten uh, over the last couple of months. And I was like, you know, these aren't that common. I don't want another Rad the Blad and Rustica situation going on. I think I'm going to put some effort into the setup. So I moved the whole colony into a really decked out 10 gallon with just like a bunch of bark and places to hide of different textures and whatnot to see if we could find like that sweet spot that they need. So I put a lot of effort into it and I'm going to put them on heat and hopefully get them going um, in, in good numbers and whatnot. Now, as I stand, as I understand it, some people in the U S apparently have the uh, Fortoioica species. Uh, some people perhaps in the chat even, uh, which is bigger and basically the same, basically the same thing, but bigger and, and better. So, but I don't have those right now. I have these. And so I have to put all my effort and, and willpower into getting another generation out of these and getting a good colony established to keep them around. So, um, so yeah, Lanx of Latterutus, hopefully available. I don't know when I have, I know I have a couple of adult uh, adult pairs. I mean, I have, I have both sexes of adults right now. Uh, who knows if they're going to love that new setup or if they're just going to hate it and they're all going to die. I don't know. Um, 
you know, I'm using bark that they, they liked when they were in the critter keeper setup. So I'm, I'm hoping that they're not just all going to suddenly drop dead and that I'm going to have a good number of them around. And hopefully they perpetuate and infest the bin that we, that that's the ideal scenario all the time. So yeah, lengths of bladder rudis. You can, you can see it's so flat, just so humorous. They just, you know, I, I believe this is uh, confirmed to be an ant defense mechanism, not just necessarily, you know, squeezing into tight places to avoid coming into contact with ants. But actually, you know, if I look at them, they have a texture to them, um, like a couple little, like little tiny rounded bumps. And I think that a lot of this is to... Um, it's to make it so that ants are unable to grip them with their mandibles so they can't pry them up and carry them off and eviscerate them. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're really, really cool roaches. Uh, I don't know if top 10. I'm kind of weird about my, like, top 10 roaches uh, that I've kept overall and just in general that I, that I find awesome. Uh, but we'll see. If I get a culture going, that'll, that'll, that'll change my mind, I'm sure, to, to cement their position somewhere. But definitely – a really, really cool and unique cockroach. You know, not just the patterning and and the um, the thinness, but uh, the the change from the nymph to the adult, and then uh, just just really cool all around. And, and the fact that it's a it's an ant anti ant anti ant uh, protection measure. So that's the length of Vladimirus I wanted to show. If anybody uh, knows anybody who is going to be upset that they missed seeing those, I can always pull them out again later and just tell me in the chat. So, uh, not going to make a page for those because I don't know if the colony is going to uh, actually persist, but hopefully. So, yeah. It's been a good week for getting a lot of stuff done. Getting a lot of new bugs. Uh, not so much for typical husbandry doing in terms of... Oh, I lost a couple of people probably because of connection or something. Not in terms of typical husbandry doing, though, since I've been so busy with all this other stuff. Um, but, yeah, definitely with respect to some new things. I may pull out a couple of those new things in a little bit, too. Um to, to show off and generate some interest. I'm trying to think if there's anything else around here. Um, general updates. The Did I say last time I had Hemithrosocera vitata babies? I may or may not have. I don't want to go back to the old stream and have to scrub through it to find if I was talking about them. But tons of babies. Uh, I counted at least 50 the last time that I went through. Uh, the Hemithrosocera vitata, the striped, striped sun roaches. Uh, I'm quite happy. Very happy that putting them in the intensive setup back over there, the, uh, that one right there, is working out, at least for now, and hoping that uh, I'll be getting, you know, the babies will be growing. And, you know, I was like, there's so many of them. I should make a page for them, and I'm more inclined to make a page for them. But also I was like, I really want to get them to the third instar, you know, because it seems like the most deaths and most problems happen with the little, the, the, the smallest sizes. You know, you just, you get, I've, I've gotten to this point before where I've gotten a good gush of babies and they just sort of like trickle out and die. But the ones I originally received were pretty small. So the same setup and there's more springtails. I can't imagine anything going wrong. Oh, and that is Victor who wants to come in. Oh, uh, do you have a fun time out there? Well, oh, you're so moist. You're so moist. So, what's up? Um, so yeah, Gene Beanie. So I've been setting up the new... What's up? What do you want? 
Uh, new enclosures, anything specific? Oh, that's right. My lights go off earlier now because of daylight savings, except for that one that I still have to turn off manually. Um, Uh, let's have the new enclosure. Anything specific I should be doing for my colony since they're not like the they're not like the dry bedding high temp dubias I've been keeping. I mean, I keep my dubias on. You should be able to keep lobsters and dubias the same, basically, with respect to humidity levels. Uh, dubia can take it really dry. I've noticed they can take it drier than some specifically dryness adapted cockroaches like Air Navega. And I'm wondering if there's something to that. I would really love to see wild dubia roaches um, because they just seem to be pretty indestructible. I mean, not with respect to, oh, they just breed in all conditions, but just like in terms of how much abuse they can take, dryness and lack of food and a bunch of other stuff. It's just like, where do these live in the wild? Are these in like dry logs or something like that? Something that just a very ruthless environment they have to they have to be like indestructible you know and the, the reason they do very well in captivity is because it's not like that we've just given them abundant resources you know so that's why they thrive but um but yeah lobster roaches should be just as it can be more productive than dubious. The only thing with lobster roaches is that once they get to a certain population density, they their reproduction slows down uh, noticeably. So in that respect, uh, once you once they get very crowded, it's good to split them or to just you know call out of them really hard because they'll stop reproducing or stop producing as many babies. Um, and it's pretty pretty well documented, Doctor. Lewis Roth, most of his most of his early work with roaches was on lobster roaches and their reproductive habits and all that stuff. So um, that's very well documented in that respect. Uh, Dubias are doing great. Females and turning out babies like mad. Yeah, I mean they're 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 they've been consistent for a while. Uh, they're being factory farmed now, so there's probably some adaptation to those conditions going on with there being thousands of them being churned out. But at the same time, from what I've heard from the factory dubia farms, they have a lot of problems keeping things sanitary with the, um, cause the dubias apparently are not adapted to being kept directly on top of each other. So there's a lot of sanitary issues for the humans working there because of all the dead roaches and the frass and the no substrate and all this stuff. Hmm. Mmm, some eggs. Introduced dubia roaches found in urban Japan. I'm not surprised. I mean, now we have more urban roaches popping up in the United States. Like, now New York is home to Paraplanita americanica, Paraplanita japonica, Blata orientalis, and Botella germanica, and presumably Supella longipalpa. So it's not surprising if there's a really good heat island you know, in Japan, whatever other, whatever else goes with that, that they would be able to survive very mild winters, especially some are coastal. Well, that's the thing, Gene, is with the egg cartons is just tens of hundreds of thousands of roaches pooping and being fed subpar diet and water crystals. Um, and not being properly hydrated and blah, blah, blah. And so things can get very unsanitary very fast um, with those numbers. It's like a lot of things. Um, so, but, you know, when you're just one person with one colony, it's very easy to be able to just, you know, pick up all the egg cartons, move them, and clean things out. But when it's a whole warehouse full of stuff, you know, yeah, I send them some microbia. I mean, they already have Dermestes Aider and the Alpha Tobias and all the stuff. They'll just end up being a gigantic suite of all these organisms that will be dealing with the dead bodies. But, you know, again, with the factory farming style of stuff, it's still kind of hard to keep up with that. And they do still need to clear out the subs, clear out the frass and um, sort by sizes for orders and all that other stuff. So... 
it's it's just 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 the not the ideal way to do things, but there is a demand for that product. So you know, it's just just how it is. Hmm. Anything else I wanted to show off before I maybe try and see? My plan was to you know work on emails and all this other stuff, but then we get such wonderful engagement with all of you people, and so then I do uh, discussion and whatnot instead, but. Um, you know, I will go ahead and, and just look through here. I've got a couple of uh, things. You know, I really dislike using common names for a lot of stuff, which is, you know, it's a, a double-edged sword considering, um, especially with some cockroach taxonomy lately, things, even the Latins change, and then there's confusion around that. Or, or you know, I was, I, I ran out of, believe it or not, I ran out of uh, powder blue isopods. Um, <laughs> I, I had started a new colony with some, some that I found in the yard and I was just like, oh, let's see how long it takes to go from 15 wild caught to like 15,000. Um, and somebody wanted to trade me for them. So anyway, so I did that, but I didn't have enough to send out for an order, but I did have of a similar biology species, the, um, checkered isopods. And so I was like, I contacted this person. I was like, hey, I did the substitution in your order. You know, husbandry's the same, blah, blah, blah. And I had to go through and do like a chain of emails to this person saying like, you know, when I looked up the, the Latin to make sure I had gotten it right and then cross-referenced it with the marine species file, whatever it is that has to keeps track of all the isopod Latin names. is like, there is no Latin name that matches this. And there's, you know, there's, a, there's dozens of isopod vendors now who just, this is just line of, you know, you Google whatever they were using for the Latin. I'm trying, I'm trying not to say it because I'm trying not to cement that old genus, fake genus name I have. I'm trying to go with the, the one that's actually correct. Um, but you, you look it up and it's just, you can tell everybody copy paste, copy paste, copy pasted what the person above them. Um, had looked up and nobody actually went to the marine species file or whatever. So anyways, these checkered isopods. So I had Alan, because I love to go to Alan for favors. Alan's wonderful. Um, I had Alan, I was like, hey, can you try and decipher what they were going for here with this? You know, there's these Latin names that have been bastardized. There's usually like you can find what the root was if you do enough digging or you have enough general knowledge. So I asked Alan. And he found out it was Ankyphylosia. So they had, everybody has been bastardizing that to Anky, Ankyophilia or something like that. But Ankyphylosia is the actual genus that they're, you know, these belong to supposedly. So it's Ankyphylosia species checkered or whatever. Um, so anyways, I can't, can't remember what got me on that, <laughs> on that tangent. Um, Joshua Campos, hello. Let's see. Hey, man, question. Do E. distantia E. species ivory seem to be seem to like the same husbandry? For some reason, my ivories have done much worse than my distanti. I keep saying distanti because so I used to say distanti. You, you can use whatever. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Um, despite basically identical enclosure conditions. No, I have kept both of them the same forever pretty much. And they both appear to be, I mean, I'm, on the books currently, they're the same species, which is silly considering they can't breed and they have different ranges and blah, blah, blah. But um, they're, they're more closely related to each other than either is to Posticus or Ceranus. So, but no, I keep them both the same. And actually, this is the exact opposite for me. My ivories are doing better than my distantes now. I think it was because I wasn't feeding the distantes enough. Distante just rolls off the tongue. Um but yeah, my ivories are doing fine. I actually um, moved them into larger open topped bins because I would like more of them because they're my favorite. Uh, ivory is so so. Here's the shenanigans with that is there is you University of Massachusetts or something like that um, has some pictures of roaches with Latin names and they would have been in contact with um, uh, Harvard for this this stuff. They have some formal pictures of, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll find it and link it right now, of Eublabrus distant eye, the six-spotted roaches. And these images have been on the internet for a very long time from University of Massachusetts. They have some other ones, like some pictures of uh, Blabrus cranifer 
and whatnot. I got I gotta find dig through and find them. Um, so they these these have been around from you know fairly official knowledgeable sources. Uh, but then if you look in the all pet or not the all pet roach book the Bio, bio.umass.edu has these images somewhere of Eublabrus distant eye on it. And I have to dig through. And, and these these cultures and reference images and whatnot would have come from God, this is a night this the site is a nightmare to navigate. It's all just like bare text. Um, but they, they have these pictures somewhere of Eublabrus distant eye, which shows what we call the six, you know, six spot cockroach because of the supposedly the six spots on the pronotum. And that was, like I said, that was from this bio.umass.edu site or wherever, which would have been in correlation or in coordination with Harvard, most likely, since they have pictures of other stuff that Roth had kept, like Schultesia and the whatnot. Anyways, where I'm going with this is that currently traded in Europe, in the U.S., and blah, 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 and a picture is even on the cockroach species file is um, distant eye, and they've been called that since I've been in the hobby for a very long time. Oh, God, it's a very long time now. Anyways, so that's what we call the six-spot roach for forever now. Now, species ivory, which came to me from Matt K in Texas, which supposedly came from whoever the old owner of Agama International was, and he apparently raised a ton of these, and that's what he fed to most of his lizards was Eublabra species ivory. So Matt Kay acquired some from him. They were friends. They were contacts. He sent them to me and was like, hey, I have these weird Eublabras. They look like distanti, distanti. Um, you can have some. I don't know you know, what they are. Just, you know, there's something unique. So he sent, I don't know, maybe 20 of them to me, and then I – started propagating them from there and then realized, oh, hey, these look different than the six spots we currently have. So he called them ivory heads because of the, you know, the adult pronotums. Um, and then I was just like, oh, it's species ivory. So that's how they were labeled. But if you look at, like I said, in the um, cockroaches evolution and behavior ecology, blah, blah, blah book, um, there is a picture of what is labeled as Eublabrus distant eye in a cave and it says you blabbers distant in fact why am i saying this let me go get the book and find it <laughs> um so this is the book that i'm talking about i believe somebody on the roach forum kindly generated or posted a link to a public access pdf of the whole book um i have to go back and check on that but anyways let me find this so as we dig into this this rabbit hole here, oh, well, you know, a picture of Cappuccino Pallida, uh, no, a Cappuccino Patula in Puerto Ioca. But that is not why we are really here. We are here for the Eublabrus distant eye picture somewhere in this book to demonstrate or to elucidate the weirdness of this situation. Aha! Here we go. So, right from the Roach book, which was, of course, by Dr. Roth, the Roach, the Roach God, there are Eublabrus, uh, I can't tell if this says it, like, like I said again, I can't tell if this is projecting it backwards or not, whatnot, but Eublabrus distant eye, and as you can see by the shape of the pronotum markings, that they are our species ivory. If you look at, do we have any locality info for ivory? No, we do not. Um... I believe the guy from Ogama International died, and so he would take that information with him to his grave. Matt K., I don't know where he's gone to. Circa 2011 or something, he was moving to Canada to focus on his art or something like that. I can't remember. Um, so I don't know if he would know either. But 
I do know that the Agama International guy was the person who brought superworms into the pet culture hobby or whatever. So, and those came from Brazil. So, but I, that probably doesn't say much about he was as an importer. He would have gotten stuff from all over the place. But anyway, so in here we see a picture of what is confirmed Eublabrus distani with those pronoto markings. The holotype for Eublabrus distani is very clearly an ivory head cockroach. Whatever that entity that we currently call ivories are is the holo, is what the holotype is for, for that species. So the problem here is then. We have multiple official sources that are saying that both of these entities are each other, probably under the assumption that the pronoto markings are just a variation across the range. But they are, I have tried to do this, you cannot cross distant eye with species ivory, so they are sexually isolated. Um, the images of species ivory come from Trinidad. I can't remember if I saw images of, dis, of, or, of species ivory, as we call it, come from Trinidad. And distant eye, I don't think is is the, the entity that we see from there. The, the images that I've seen of wild individuals or wild cultures that Europeans have gotten do not come from Trinidad. So, um, so yeah, that's the that's the problem. And then again, the cockroach species file has the picture of the holotype for Eublabrus distant eye as listed on the cockroach species file is a species ivory, undebatably. And then they also have a picture of the whatever in culture. And it's the, what we're calling six spots or distant eye currently. So something needs to be teased apart there. And the most logical thing is if species ivory matches the holotype, then we have to call those distant eye. But the problem with that is that we don't have a name or identity for what we're currently calling six spots. And though it's not a problem if people are physically mixing up the lines because they're reproductively um, isolated, you know, it's still more confusion than we need to inspire currently. So until both entities can be identified and given Latin names, just this, this general miasma of, of, of confusion is going to continue. So anyways, that is my rant on that uh, with pictures. It's possible that our six spots are an undescribed species, I guess. Sex guitata, sex maculata. Yeah, well, the other thing is, oh, hello, a little spider in my arm. I don't know where you came from. It looks like a little uh, uh, sporacid, maybe. Right there. I don't know where that came from. Oh, no, it's a brown recluse. Um, <laughs> let's see if uh, pulling up the Eublabrus on the cockroach species file. You'll, like I said, it's it's kind of a fool's, fool's errand right now because if you go to the distant eye page, and I will link to it, you will see that the holotype specimen is an ivory head cockroach, without question. And if you go to the see all images and you go to this, the pictures of a living adult and nymph, it shows what we currently call six spots. So um, definitely an oversight on somebody's part. Known where the types are, or could those have been lost in the Brazil collection fire? Here's, I just posted a link to the species file page. Uh, specimen records are available. Holotype of species Eublabrus distant eye. Oh, that was another reason why I was calling the ivories biolii on the website is because the holotype of synonym, synonym um, Eublabrus biolii, because it's seeing see, the holotype is a synonym, synonym ugh, tongue tied, of uh, Blabrus biolii. That means that there may be some. A select holotype of distant eye. Um, Depository London Natural History Museum. And this other one for Bioli is <clears throat> uh, ANSP Philadelphia. So, um, but, but with Bioli eye as a synonym in here, you know, is a, I guess a junior synonym. I guess that puts our six spots in the running for possibly being biolii on the books. You know, so, but but I mean, I guess like I said at the end of the day, the the, 
the, the big thing here is that our ivories are, by the holotype, are distant eye. Oh, that's a weird specimen. Here's here, here's one with like almost solidly dark pronotum, but you can still see the markings. You know, if you look at the markings on the six spots and the ivories, they're pretty much like an inverse of each other. You know, um, with the the anterior markings on the ivories and the most, you know, the, the largest ones are usually anteriorly and on the um, Six spots, they're posteriorly restricted, you know, with the two little dots towards the front. You know, even the nymphs have, are, are different. If you if you really look at them, the uh, ivory nymphs actually have six spots on them versus the, uh, the six-spot roach nymphs only have, like, four spots. I always thought, you know, I, when I first started roaches, like, this is weird. Why is it called the six spot roach? I think it's in the all pet roach book. That's like, Oh, it's cause the nymphs have six spots. And I was like, they only have four. And, but you know, the adults do, they have the like two on the pronotum, the two small ones and like the bigger meat blob one on it. So anyways, that needs to be teased apart. Another fun thing to do for somebody. That's not me. Maybe. I mean, the biggest problem would be using captive specimens, I think, to describe with no locality information or anything like that. <clears throat> Although, again, the uh, what we currently call six spots might be traceable back to uh, Roth's uh, Roach Lab and whatnot. <clears throat> so that's the that's the chaos going on there with those guys is figuring out what to call what without. Creating giant confusion, and if we have a final say on Latin names for them, then we can definitively do the switch and start calling the ivories as they properly should be, which is just an eye. But until our six spots have some sort of distinguishing label, it's just going to create a bunch of chaos. So um, I think that the sexual isolation evidence is more than enough to substantiate them being different ent entities uh full stop i mean you got more morph morphological too they're, they're, they're different roaches just our six spots get smaller than um ivories different markings different nymph morphology patterning so like there are more more similarities between eublaborus serranus nymphs and eublaborus posticus nymphs than there are between you blabberous between six spots and ivory nymphs. So um, yeah, so that that's 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 that whole can of uh, can of worms, can of roaches to open up there. Mm. Anybody got a good common name for Dipteratrum handstromi? Any, I know the American Cockroach Society has a official one, but you know, I dislike the arbitrarily picked common names. You know, just at least go to the Latin, find something that suits the transliteration of that, and then slap it on there if you're going to do, you know, a common name. Um, simple as. What else did I want to show off or talk about or something tonight? Victor brought something in here to chew on. I hope that's something you're allowed to have, whatever that is. Oh, yeah, you can have that. Um, yeah, I touched on Hemithrosocera. Uh, showed off the links of Blad. A uh, bunch of other fun stuff has come in and is here as I look around for something else. Uh, I guess I'll make a big announcement on some things very, very shortly. I'm going to go dispose of my food that I was sloppily eating.
All right. Semi big announcement time for a smaller crowd. Let's see what's going on here. Alan says, Do you still keep Lobopterella Dimidia Titans? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, let's see how this Drosophila Hide Eye culture is doing. Lord, do I hate working with Drosophila Hide Eye. Uh, yes, Alan, here is culture of Lobopterella Dimidia Typees. Uh, status. Uh, I see plenty of babies. So, yeah, I do still keep them, and they are doing quite well. And no, Victor, you cannot eat them. Good Lord. You're just ogling at this... Um, I was at a local pet store the other day and, you know, saw these these things for sale. Uh, I haven't kept hide eye in a couple of years. Once I got – last year I, I was able to find a bizarre eye, bizarre eye again, uh, and I've had a line of inbred – very, very, very inbred melanogaster going for about a year and three months, year and two months. Um, and so, you know, I thought, oh, here's a culture. It's like $12, whatever. You know, I could get them at the show, but these ones are, they're all black. The ones at the shows, usually you'll get like a mixture of the golds or whatever in there, or they'll just be straight up golds, which seem to be a bit hardier. But it's like, if I want, if I get high dye, I want these like plump black ones. Like I want the bigger, huger fruit fly, uh, since, you know, I would just use buzzard eye, buzzard eye. Hello, Rachel. Thank you for joining us. Um, anyways. So I bought these, and I'm just I'm just looking at the culture. I set it on a high shelf. I was going to put it, like, next to a lamp. But then I remember that if you keep them too hot, the little protein or whatever heritably unfolds, and then you end up with flying high dye. And that's something I definitely don't want. So I was just, like, looking at, like, how uncomfortable this culture makes me feel. It just looks really gross, whatever this medium they're using is. And I think I saw a Ford fly in here. So that's slightly concerning, but you know, I guess I wanted to get work with high dye again. So this is the price that I pay. Uh, but buzzadi, eye, bazinga, bazonko, whatever. Um, Cause I slowly lose my sanity on stream. Uh, bazadi, I, I am in love with because they're a larger fruit fly. They're larger than melanogaster. They live longer. The cultures are slower to produce. Show off the cool dragonflies, the cool drainflies. Um, I will, Will, as soon as I am done preaching the wonders of Drosophila bizarii. Um, But anyways, anybody need fruit flies out there? You know, and you don't want to work with high dye because they're a pain and I dislike them greatly. <laughs> um, work, get, get some uh, bizarii. I love that, unlike melanogast, so they don't just burn through the medium quickly. And unlike high dye, which seems to take forever to get producing, and then you can have few die offs, there's just a nice trickle of adults out of the culture. Um, so, yeah, I really like those. I'll show off the drain flies while Will's brought it up. Actually, I hope they have Is this container desiccated. Nope, it hasn't. Oh, boy. Oh, man. This gets grosser every time I look at it. So, this is, this is disgusting, first and foremost. <laughs> This is a fruit fly culture that somehow got invaded by small drain flies. And I think I've seen the same species of drain fly in my gutters. And I don't see any adults right now. And I don't know if everybody wants to just stare at this disgusting container that's been sitting in the corner of the room up here for the past nine months. Do I see any larvae though? I'm gonna, do a, I'm gonna open this up over here by the light and I'm gonna probably a bunch of adults are gonna fly out at me. No, there's one. Oh, 
What a delightful smell. So anyways, so Will, remind me again. <laughs> remind me again in, a, in a, a couple of weeks when this has another bloom of adults so I can open it up and release a bunch of them into the bug room for people's entertainment apparently. Um, so Will thinks these ones are cooler, but I really think those Lepisiodina conspicua are, are the epitome of, uh, our, of uh, moth fly beauty until we find another species that has cool markings on the wings. Anyway, semi-important announcement. Do I have anything on hand to use to, to uh, present for this? Maybe? Uh, I guess I'll use this. So semi-important announcement is can we see them? Can tilt this a little bit. I don't want to disrupt them. I'm getting back into mansions. <laughs> That's the announcement. Don't tell no the drain fly. No, the drain flies were not the announcement tonight. The important announcement is I'm getting back into mantids. I feel like I'm in a good place with the uh, husbandry and with Will assisting with stuff and um, space management and blah blah blah. Almost zero trees in my area. And can we would eat sweet potato leaf? Uh, yeah, a lot of things eat sweet potato leaf leaves. In fact, if you're producing tons of sweet potato leaves, leaves, please stay in touch with me because I'm gonna need uh, slips of them <laughs> over the uh, winter for my tortoise beetles. Uh, but anyways, mantids. So this, I'm getting back into mantids. I've been in touch with a couple of mantid breeders. We've had some. Um, good conversations about uh, regular supply and whatnot. And, you know, I'd like to try my hand at breeding a couple of species. I'm, I am definitely far more into the roachy mantids like Mantoida and Metalyticus and Gonatista and even Deroplatus look very roachy with their giant pronotums. Uh, but these, these are, this is the thing of orchids. Just your run of the mill Hymenopus coronatus right here. So, um, so, yeah, that was a big announcement. So keep an eye peeled on the website. I'll be adding actual species profiles for them. So, yeah, mantids, predatory cockroaches, the, the most gimmicky cockroach, I feel. <laughs> Wildflowers and sweet potato vines. Yeah, I have a lot of sweet potato, not sweet potato, I have a lot of um, the related bindweed in my front yard. I put it there on purpose to attract the tortoise beetles, the um, Michigan native ones. So I have that to use all summer. But the problem is it's not summer anymore. And I do have that, that tangled mass of stuff over there, which you probably only see like the dead leaves because of the reflection from the light or whatever. But uh, that's all sweet potato vine that I am desperately trying to propagate to get my tortoise beetles through the winter. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, yeah, I, I need just vegetation constantly. I went and um, for some other stuff I have acquired. Uh, I went and tarped some blackberry in the backyard. Something I don't normally do. So I put a 12 foot by 10 foot tarp over a patch of big patch of blackberry to try and keep it evergreen through the winter. Since I I saw a twig of it last year that got covered by a solid tarp, um, and I went out there in January and it was still all the leaves were still attached and green and whatnot. So I figured, oh, if I just protect it, this patch has the potential to stay green. Uh, but you know, I will show off one other thing and. That is directly on hand. There are many secrets to roach crossing in the various roach rooms. There will be no vigilantism on my watch. A little ticked off that I captured it. So this is a uh, Anisomorpha, Anisomorpha buprostoides uh, 
skeleton stick. And this is the, there we go. They can calm it down a little bit. Whoop. So, and this is one of the uh, best locale, probably the best locality for just solid black and white individuals. Uh, there's a lot of areas where they get a lot of orange or they're, they're more predominantly orange striped. But um, this one, what do my things say? Marion, Marion County. Um, the collector refuses to give specific locations, but will give me counties. So these are from Marion County. Um, but this is one of the best locales, you know, all, almost all of the wild caught individuals have pure black and white like this. Leave the sweet potatoes then and keep, let them keep growing, not nearly as fast since it's cold, but they're still mostly there and thriving. Yeah, they, mine all got hit by frost and died. Whoa. Stick bug on the keyboard. Mine all got hit by frost and died. Uh, but like I said, I have these cuttings here and really hoping... Uh, that I can, I just need to get just a couple of adults to like the spring. I'm going to try propagating some more sweet potatoes in, in another room too under a bright light. How often do they spray? I don't really get sprayed when I have a nissomorphos. It's really weird. There's a couple times where I'll like, if I poke it like a nymph pile, I'll get it. I don't get like in the eyes. I just sort of like, I get like the smell and I actually kind of like the smell. <laughs> just like Eurycotus. Um... Uh, some eggs, the species is Anisomorpha uh, euprestoides. So, um, and this is the Marion County skeleton stick. This is like the uh, best best locality for this stark contrast black and white. Probably the easiest stick bug to care for, and I know people say that about a lot of things, but honestly, you really can't beat an Anisomorpha, you know, being U.S. native and uh, not fragile like a lot of other stick bugs where if you look at them they will drop legs and they will eat all kinds of plants um, including uh, invasive ones so you can help out your local ecology by going out and cutting the branches off of all those invasive shrubs that these guys will eat <laughs> um, so yeah I, I'm, I'm very fond of anisomorpha I have uh, for buprestoides I have these guys in the Marion counties. So we have a bunch of them available. I have a bunch of eggs. Poke it. Poke. Poke. <laughs> um, and this is more of a spray in the face once one recommend it. Yeah, I haven't been sprayed in the eyes or anything like that. Watch it happen on stream, though. Just watch it. <laughs> but um, like I said, I rather do enjoy the smell of it. It's like... There's nothing else that really smells like it. It's kind of like a weird, like, cologne smell. Um, honeysuckle, yes. Honeysuckle is what I use for, for my wool. They will also eat uh, burning bush fairly sparingly, I think. There's another invasive that they were they were eating for me. Privet. Privet. They love to eat privet, too. So, um, so yeah, I have, I have these Marion County ones. Which, which I'm very fond of and will probably be throwing up a page on the site for because I'm going to be having a lot of hatches very soon unless I put them in the, the wine cooler, put the eggs in the wine cooler. Um, so I have these and then I have a locality that we found in uh, Key West. There's no records on iNaturalist or I don't even think there's official records for them living on Key West, but we found a colony of them, um, I think they were on red mangrove. There was one, tr one mangrove tree in the whole swamp that we explored that had um, anisomorpha on it. And they're just kind of a regular brown chocolate colored anisomorpha. But I like it because it's probably the southernmost that Buprestoides ranges. Whoa. So... Uh, was as bad as Platymeris spray. Oh yeah, I, I haven't been sprayed by Platymeris. I've seen them shoot the the venom, and I've heard them rattle their wings. It's just like, wow, what a great, what a great way to adapt all these things to like keep stuff from eating you. Being venomous, being able to spray venom, being brightly colored, being uh, cryptic behavior, and being able to make an abrupt, sudden rattling noise. <laughs> Someone hasn't been sprayed by 50 of these at once. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, maybe I'm immune to the, whatever the irritant chemical is that these things produce. 
Uh, Tyler, I have not tried keeping Megaphasma. I thought we found Megaphasma in Texas this year. I don't know what they are. They might be actually a Diaphoramora. They were on Mesquite, and I have those eggs somewhere over here. I, I really don't want to put too much effort into getting them to hatch because they just – both times I tried to keep them, the adults died quickly. It could have just been because they wanted to eat Mesquite. They'll probably eat Blackberry or whatever. Um, but uh, a uh, – customer is sending me a box of stuff from Louisiana and he is sending some megaphasma eggs. So I haven't kept them. This will be my first time. And I was telling him like, Hey, assume these will all die. Just assume that I'm going to fail with them. Um, another contact, not uh, actually a person I bought from uh, was going to send me some megaphasma eggs. I haven't been able to get in touch with him though, but he was raising them on, Eastern red cedar, and apparently he collected them on red cedar too. And he was saying that they uh, they don't do they don't you know they don't grow like crazy on red cedar, and they don't get as large, but um, as on like brambles. But they eat it, and like that's super easy for me to get even in the dead of the winter here. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to try that with this particular batch. Oh, and. See you later, Gene. Thank you for, for tuning in. And yeah, more news on how your colonies are doing would be wonderful. Oh, shoot. They are still out in Ocala. Oh, yeah, Alan, you might encounter some of them. I would assume that their season just ranges until they get hit by a frost or something. I found Megaphasma dentricus in Indiana a few months ago. Whoa. Okay. Um, did you keep any eggs? Uh, so. I'm, I'm hoping that the person named Some Eggs has some eggs from the Megaphasma he collected. Or she. Yeah, I don't know which, which you are so or what you are. So um, I would hope that the entity known as Some Eggs has eggs of Megaphasma. Once or twice only on Oaks, if that helps. Yeah, they're not really something I'm, like, questing hardcore for. I was very happy to accept those, the... Um, the freebie eggs, because if they, you know, if I get a couple of them to hatch and raise them, it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, very easy, very low effort in acquiring and whatnot. Um, and of course, if that other contact ever comes through and uh, has some to offer, I think his are a couple of generations captive bred too, which I definitely appreciate more of because, you know, if he's been feeding them red seed, they'll be probably, you know, better micro adapted to feeding on it than on other things. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a huge stick bug person. I'm not a huge stick bug person. I, the main reason I like the Anisomorpha is because they're just like roaches, but with a twist, they're just like leaf eating roaches. So, you know, and I have, there's honeysuckle all over the place here. So I can like cut branches and freeze leaves and whatnot for them. And I know that it's like, I, if I really, really, really had to find something to feed, you know, I, I know that I can keep a colony going through the winter if I have them hatch out and whatnot. Um, so, and of course, the you know, color in the, the U.S. native. So there, there's that too. <laughs> um, I mean, this is just this is awesome, you know? And I do like things that are earthy color, which is why I like those Key West ones too. Uh, I would bring some out to show but they're, they're still, they're like half the size of this still. Um, but yeah, I really, and they're handleable, you know, people talk about not handling certain types of phasmids because you'll snap their legs off. They'll just drop legs. It's like, I've dropped it. This has dropped off my hand a couple of times and I have no concern for its, you know, quality of life or well-being declining from that. So yeah, they're just really awesome. Oh, and I do have, as I mentioned, the two localities of new prostoides. Uh, the person who's sending the megaphasma is also sending, uh, it was a very last minute addition to the box, but he found a pair of uh, Ferruginea. And I was just like, yes, finally again. I mean, it's just Ferruginea, but still it's cool. <laughs> so one of our two species of Anisomorpha in the United States. Uh, distinguished by... I've seen some try to do it by locality. I don't think that's very effective. 
except maybe like a Narcissus annularis, Narcissus americanus thing, where it's just like, if you're like north of Ohio, you're probably finding annularis, according to rest in peace, Dr. Shelley. And if you're south of that, it's probably americanus. But it's kind of harder with the Frugine and the Buprestoides. So, um, but you distinguish them by egg shape. Very clear on uh, Buprestoides, the eggs are, they're ovals. And the eggs uh, from Ferruginea, they look kind of like Hot Pockets. <laughs> they look kind of like warty Hot Pockets. It's a very pleasant, maybe a not so pleasant image, but they look like warty Hot Pockets, basically. <laughs> um, so, you know, and again, they're just as easy as the, the Buprestoides. So look how chill this thing is. Uh, and I do, I do get a big kick out of the males that live just to reproduce and just, just, ride the females around and I, i'm down to to two females probably that's because of um i didn't i didn't put in enough honeysuckle after i got back from a show and so i had a couple of females uh die from that but i i have the and probably from old age too you know, they, there's just like hundreds of eggs this is raining eggs in that container hello victor uh victor has had an encounter with uh anisomorpha while I was cleaning the Key West ones, he was sniffing them and he got sprayed. He didn't like that very much. So do you remember what this is, huh? Maybe? Do you remember that you don't like these? Maybe you do. <laughs> um, well, we conclude the Key West. So I have no idea what those weird plastered things were on that mesh cage because it was completely clean when I put the <clears throat> stick bugs in there. I sent the pictures to that uh, European phasmid expert, and he was like, keep me posted. And then I kept an eye out for actual, you know, like eggs in, in the frass and whatnot, and I found them. So I'm wondering if it was like a parasitoid or something that was on the stick bugs or maybe something that cro – what's up? Or maybe something that crawled off of uh, the branches that I brought in. So the Key West ones are buprestoides, full stop. Um, although – there is that species that's found in like Costa Rica and further south. I have no idea how they would disjunct and then, of course, be feeding on mangroves. But just the fact that we're feeding on mangroves is really cool. Bummer. A bummer. The southernmost population of Anisomorpha. And it's a bummer of Anisomorpha Buprestoides. And it's a bummer for you, Alan. Satchel says, I know a spot for Anisomorpha here in Tuscaloosa that's never had a ton, but has been consistent past me. I can find some in the spring. Yeah, you know, they don't seem to have, like, a huge major season where they just all disappear. I think they might even overwinter as nymphs in some places. I think they're very flexible like that because the eggs take maybe two to four months to hatch, uh, depending on a lot of things. And they just, you know, you don't have to cool them. Like, I mean, diaphragma, I guess you don't have to cool either from my experience, but you don't get a good, as good of a hatch if you do cool the eggs. Don't you eat my orchid mantids. I will be very upset. <laughs> um, uh, still, they were all adults. Concrete wall of a dam come out and crawl on the cracks in the rocks. Yeah, you know, like I said, they're like the roaches of the stick bugs, which is why I like them. Also, the fact that they don't necessarily hang out on the foliage of their host. They just sort of, like, live off and away. Which also, you know, the fact that they'll eat, like, dead leaves very readily and as if it's just completely natural for them is another major selling point for me. I would like to get the – there's a couple of localities that are mostly orange, too. I, I kind of I pressed the collector to find me the black and white ones because I haven't had them in a while and I was ready to fully commit to keeping a colony going. Uh, but there are colony or, uh, localities that have very nice, you know, like a Halloween orange stripes instead of the uh, white stripes too. Splat has flooded, but no, they probably don't have good flood adaptations. But I can't imagine they sink, so they probably just scramble up out of the out of the water as it's rising or whatever. So it's, uh, look at that thing. Like this, th not only does this thing exist, this thing exists in the United States. There are people who go about their daily days in Florida, their daily lives in Florida and don't realize that these things are just like there and they're just like awesome. And they're just like, 
hanging out and breeding and stuff, having a good time. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's as I go to use my mouse. That's uh, and this amorpha buprestoides Marion County Steli sticks for you. Seems like that brought a couple of people into the chat, so welcome or into the live stream. Try to think of anything else. Not not too many new um, miscellaneous random updates per se. The hand, touch on the hand beetles, touch on the breaking mantid news. Hmm. Anything else here? Oh, might as well. I hope it doesn't chew on me. Just in case Kai is here. Uh, horse lover. There's a horse lover female. A blog post went up about uh, the horror of watching this thing overposit. Uh, yeah. So hopefully be working with these. It was not a good year for me for keeping my, my Eastern lovers going. It's life. Um, but this, this, uh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> um, so Kai has the rest of these uh, with him. He brought this female over. She overposited. And it was, I can't believe how far these abdominal segments can stretch out when they're overpositing. It's just like. It extends to like three times the length of the abdomen as it currently is. It's just very grotesque. It's like when you find bugs that have fallen into water and started to rot and their abdomens just stretch out all the way. It was very gross, <laughs> but very cool. So uh, favorite variation is the ones found here that have the burning orange color to them. Yeah, actually, Alan, if you – when you guys are in Archbold, um, and if you find any of those anisomorpha there – you know, you have a friend who would like a couple of them or some eggs, you know? It literally looks like a horse. Yeah, you know, it's it's got like the like weird neck scenario thing, your weird neck shape thing going on, like a like a horse that's like walking, you know how they hold the way they hold their head. Check the site and yeah, that's horrifying. Yeah, whoa. Uh, Kai Brand and I were there watching. Oh actually, dude, what color are their hind wings? Do you have do you have freaky hind wings like uh like Easterns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably gonna bite me, of course. We got some pretty uh, can you see? I don't wanna hurt her. Got some pretty hind wings. Yeah, just like Easterns. Yeah, that's a cool bug. You know, I think people when they, do they those make sound? Yeah, it just hissed at me actually, or, or it wasn't really a hiss. It was more like a, I guess it was a hiss. It was like a soft, very soft hiss, nothing like a Gromford or Rhino would make. <clears throat> um, I get the feeling that you know people have really covet horse lovers. I get the feeling they think they're a lot bigger than they actually are. Like this adult female, and I don't know if Kai brought me like the biggest one, but this is pretty congruent with the ones that I received, you know, a couple of years ago and the, the sparing number that I've seen out in the wild. Um, but this female is only about the size of an adult male Eastern lover. It's very, you know, I, I get the feeling they think that because they're found further south and they're, they, they're I guess, a bit more exotic looking that they would be bigger. But this... This is only about the size of a of like the average like male eastern lover. And yeah, yeah, Ty, it's like a it's like a pinkish reddish color. So but I do I do like the the way that the uh, the orange looks. It's more of a saturated and there's more gradients between things on there. Oh yeah, look look look, look at this. I could the perfect thumbnail right here to debate people. I but if you with the whole chat, whoever's here is my witness. If I ever get to the point where I'm doing uh, gimmicky faces and bugs held this close to the camera for views, like, please end me. <laughs> I don't care how you do it. 
but please end me. Like, take me for a long walk off a short pier or something. Um, I would like to have some dignity. I will freak out. I will reserve the right to freak out as much as I want to upon, you know, looking at weird moth fly cultures or looking at cool roaches or stick bugs, etc. But please end my suffering if I ever get to that point. Because there is no amount of money on the planet worth sacrificing what remains of my dignity. So, um, anyways, this is a bug live stream. If if you all didn't know that already, and not a uh, philosophical uh, post consumerist society uh, discussion live stream. <laughs> so, but anyways, that aside, I think she's getting ready to overposit again. This kind of looks like she's. She wants to, kind of, like the, the mind is telling her no, but the body's telling her yes kind of thing. I'll probably leave her in the, the current setup without somewhere to overposit for one to three more days. You lost your dignity with the cactus video. <laughs> uh, um, Draco Tedx Monstrosis would be a fun one. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the like, really warty-looking one. I'm going to Google that right now. Oh. Yeah, that's a, a pretty cool-looking grasshopper. I was thinking more about those Central American acridids or whatever, the ones that have, like, really funky, funky colors and whatnot. Oh, actually, Tyler... While you are here, and while I'm handling a grasshopper, uh, I do have eggs from Texas uh, rainbow grasshoppers. I hopefully have eggs from pure Arizona rainbows. And then I hopefully also have eggs from uh, male Texas rainbow crossed with female uh, Arizona rainbow grasshoppers. Uh, we'll see how they do. Uh, the majority of them are currently in the wine cooler. Uh, I'll probably pull them out around January or something. Whenever I have like abundant free time to raise more grasshopper nymphs. Um, but yeah, so I do have those. And hopefully those uh, Melanopolis differentialis that are yellow from Texas too. We actually found a... I got out of the car to collect a cactus pad in Texas. And like there were just hordes of those yellow differentials. And it was like... Happy accident, you know, restart my colony. Shut up, Alan. I had to. Ben uh, Ben's, Ben would not go out and collect me another male after my initial one died on the way back. So I decided to I let the females get whatever they had to out of their system, you know, because one of them was immature when, and matured when it got here. And the other one, I think, was a wild caught, was, was wild as an adult, so it could have been fertilized. But... They had their opportunity. I labeled the cup with the possible pure eggs. So now, you know, there could be the locality cross. Because actually, Tyler, do you know if the all the rainbow subspecies are still considered valid? Because I don't think Bug Guide is currently running with them uh, as they were before. But I remember there's like north, there's like a northern one, there's like a the southern one, and then there's the eastern one of the uh, rainbows. You know, looking at this thing, the plains lubbers were bigger than this, especially the females. It's certainly bulkier. Maybe not quite as long, but I do have eggs of those too. I, I don't know if they're going to hatch. They're really cool. They did better for me now than any other time before, and I'm wondering actually if that's because um, any other time that I received adult plains lubbers, I wonder if the seller had just like thrown them into a tub and left them without like food or water for a couple days and then shipped them. And that's why they all just started dropping dead when they got here because the ones we brought back this year were quite hardy. Toad lovers. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I do really like my orthopterans. I do really like grasshoppers, but boy, are they a lot of work and definitely not, not a level of work that I was willing to commit to over the summer. Most of the time, Oh, but during the winter when I have nothing better to do, they sell bugs <laughs> and start projects. It's like, okay, here we go. Here's another thing. So, yeah, that's a, what an interesting bug. I like the yellow cheeks. 
I think that might be my favorite part is the, the little yellow cheeks. Last I heard, it's up, Tyler says, last I heard, it's up in the air with respect to the rainbow grasshopper subspecies scenario. I think a couple people are going to town on a lot of the North American melanoplanes, so there might be some clarity coming from that. They're still up on orthop species file, though. Okay. So maybe I, I committed sacrilege by crossing them, but I have everything labeled. And, you know, wouldn't that be interesting to prove or disprove some people's points if there was – you know, if they didn't hatch or if they, they did hatch, um, it would be interesting to see what sort of characteristics they have. And, of course, I still have the pure Texas ones and hopefully have pure Arizona ones. I didn't confirm any eggs uh, in with the, uh, Ar the Arizona ones before I add the male of the other locality. Hmm. Oh, man, it is only 8.50, and I feel like it's 11.50. I think we'll probably go for, I don't know, 10, 15 more minutes. I don't know if there's anything more that I really want to show off. Put this girl back. So, yeah, any additional questions or points? Phrynotetics would be fun, but I think the food source is the big question mark. I think they feed on weird forbs. So supposedly rainbows are supposed to be picky, but these both of the ones I had just ate general stuff. Uh, I was feeding them like Biden's alibi grew shiny spider beetles. What about shiny spider beetles? Um, anyways, back back with the rainbows. When I was just feeding them uh, white lambs quarters and dog food and trying to see what's dried up in that tank because I was using it for them to uh, can the thistle. Um, you know, just weird arguments. I had a lot of vegetation though. Hmm. Ott would be the one to figure it out. He's dissecting every melano melanoplane he can and completely rewriting various genera. Okay. That was just the character needed some work. All the bug guide things are like these paragraphs and like, this species like looks almost like this one, but then it also hybridizes with this one here, but it's also like very sparsely located here. So. Yeah. Bit of a mesh, some of those things. Just like roach taxonomy. Here is somebody who sent me a uh, order and is saying he needs them ASAP. Little does he know that the shipping roster is completely blocked up for this upcoming week. It's going to be kind of a hell. But that's okay. Thus, thus can be life. I'm trying to think any other things. Um... Enter week three or four or something of me having absolutely no idea if all the Ptoptera I have died or not. <laughs> um, I haven't seen the ones in with the Lobopter. Why am I no so itchy? I always shave to look pre presentable before this, and I feel like my whole face gets itchy after I shave because I miss stuff. Um, anyways, Ptoptera. So I had the initial set from TJ, which I put in with uh, Lobopter because... I didn't want to make another container, and I figured that they would help to eat, keep the food open, blah, blah, blah. And then I got another set from TJ when he sent the Perispherus mails last week, which arrived during right before the live stream last week. So then I was like, okay, well, I put those, sort of said screw it, and threw those ones in with the Lobopter. So we'll do a more separate setup for this other set just in case as a as a uh, contingency protocol um so before i answer mr edward uh coffee's question i'm going to show off this after a setup so I, I took the auburn approach alan um for trying these where it's just food ventilation and wick waterer uh i think i see a single molt that fell to the bottom here. They're so freaking tiny. It's hard to tell if it's a molt or a dead body, but I think it's a molt 
It's, it's just like right over here, but there should be five or six Plectopter in here. Um, I just tore the paper towel and threw it in there. I wasn't going to try and flick the nymphs off or something. You'd probably kill them because they're so tiny. So I just set them in here. Um, there's like dog food and like apple and mango and fish flakes deposited into the pine cone. And I figured that they'll be able to get into like the right moist microclimates in the pine cone. And then maybe if I'm fortunate one day, uh, an adult female and adult male will materialize in here and they will start laying eggs in the moist spot, which is probably right on the tip of the wick water. So, um, just throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what sticks for these. Eventually I would like to get them into a larger formal culture. That is not a pain like that because you know, the course in Europe, are doing great in with the, the Bantua and, and in the solo setup. I even put some into a five and a half gallon because I didn't want them to die because I didn't want you to skin me alive, Alan. Um, so, yeah, it would be nice to have an actual container with those that isn't gimmicky or something with a cleanup crew or whatnot. Edward, what do Thermobia domestica eat? Uh, for me, potato flakes, dog food, and marshmallows. That pine cone doesn't have piney chemicals that hurt them. That's an excellent question. So uh, I go and pilfer pine cones from a parking lot behind a Burger King nearby where they, they sit and they just sort of like age and weather on like this uh, unused section of the parking lot. And then also I bring them home, wash them out with scalding hot water, helps to get the resin off. It's like the dirt out from in between them and whatnot. And then depending on how I'm feeling, I either just let those set on a, sit on a high shelf in the in a dry area or I'll put them in the oven and bake them. That helps to get some of those volatile chemicals out. So, but yeah, aged pine cones, you could, you could, what you could probably do theoretically is just get a bunch. If you wanted to you know, skip all that intensive process and wanted to be extra super duper duper comfortable, get a bunch of pine cones bury them in some topsoil or bury them outside and then dig them up in like a month or two during warm weather. You know, they'll just, they'll, the leech and the microbes and fungi will colonize them and break them down. And, you know, all kinds of stuff is a very expedited process. And then you can feel a lot, you even better if you want to, but I just, like I said, hit them with scalding water. Uh, and I really like them. I think I'm going to start selling pine cones, <laughs> start selling pine cones on the roach crossing site because a lot of the uh, ectobiids really like to hide in them. Uh, they're relatively hygienic. If you want to uh, collect roaches for sale or something, you just tap on the pine cone and they fall out. You know, the roaches are probably grazing on them a little bit. Um, and crickets. Crickets really like them too, especially my Gryllus uh, assimilus colony. So I'm going to be using them a lot more for crickets and baby cave crickets, but that seems to be kind of hit or miss um, in my experience whether or not a species or will like them or whether they'll be particularly helpful. So any other questions or getting close to nine? I know I started the stream late. So if anybody's just absolutely dying for me to, to stick around for the full actual two hours, you let me know and I will be right here fumbling through emails or attempting to put up new species pages. Uh, and, uh, uh, Luki Hormetica grossi should be available again soon. Checked on them because I was uh, somebody had inquired about them, and I thought, oh yeah, I'm gonna have babies now. But I went and checked on them, and no newborns yet. But oh, them ladies is thick. Them some big girls. Like I can't believe how not just like you know the the frame of the female grow side that I'm having pop up are, you know, like without the extended abdomen from being gravid, but the gravid ones, they're like there were some that were like this this long compared to the longest like varicosa or subkincta I've ever seen was like that. It was pretty crazy, like that compared to like that. So how easy difficult are shining spider beetles to keep and breed? They are like the easiest thing to keep and breed. Uh, put them in a container with good ventilation and put dog food in it and then put it on a shelf and forget about it. 
The only problems you can have are grain mites. If the humidity goes too high and there's too much debris because the grain mites will feed on the gr debris from the uh, spider beetles. Um, or parasitoid wasps some, sometimes find their way in from nature or outside. We find their way into the colony from who knows where. Uh, no soil, just the food. That's it. Um, so let me show you an example of that set up on these. Uh, I went on a, a long rant earlier about how cool these are that Will and I just found today, these red-legged hand beetles. But this is this setup works for spider beetles, for shiny, for mesium affini. Same thing, just a thing of dog food. Uh, this lid, I'm using these smaller poked hole lids for these uh, red-legged uh, red legged hand beetles uh, because... The adults can fly, and they most likely can chew through a cloth lid, which is what I would normally use for these containers, like I use for all the year in a vega and whatnot. Uh, so that's why I went with this. So this is might be a little too little ventilation for spider beetles and preventing grain mites, maybe. Uh, depends on what your ambient air humidity is, but these are also being heated a bit because I really want to get them producing. <laughs> um so, but yeah, just basically this, laying dog food. Very easy. All uh, Grain pests feed on grain and don't need much care. Who would have guessed? I'm going to get these right in the right spot. So, yeah. Uh, that's sort of the updates on everything. Next week, Thursday, we'll do a stream. Uh, I'm not sure... It's just going to be a lot of the expo this Saturday is going to take up most of my time tomorrow with packing all my day Saturday. Sunday, I may have some time to do misc email, blah, blah, blah work. And then Monday, Tuesday, and even Wednesday are probably all going to be shipping days this week because it has been insane, which I thank all my lovely customers for allowing me, enabling me to do this and bring them lovely bugs and to have a house full of cockroaches and to have a neighbor who occasionally calls the city on me and blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, sometimes it can be a bit much having to spend two-ish days working on packing and emails and coordinating. So, um, yeah, and then I'll be taking a couple of days off to do some uh, hanging and whatnot with friends, uh, as, as a, we are accustomed to doing at this time of year. And then next week, I think uh, Thursday's Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving will not be doing a stream. I haven't decided yet if I want to bump if I, if I want to bump things and do a stream Wednesday before Thanksgiving or Friday after Thanksgiving, or just take a break from streaming for a week. Uh, I do love doing this and coming in and checking in, showing off, and blah 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 with everybody. So but maybe, maybe I'll take a, a break for a week and then pick it up the following week. That would also give me some time um, after that to just focus on getting pictures for stuff on the site. There's still things on the new species page from last year that I haven't gotten pictures for, which is why they're still there. I'd like to get pictures um, on, on these things that are here. I didn't get a picture for little gem roaches. Well, thank, thank God there's like 500 of them now. It'll be easier to get of the whole colony. So, um, yeah, I guess I can, can, nothing's stopping me from going to, for two hours a day, I suppose. I'm getting a little hungry, but I guess I could eat some of that dog food if I really had to. Let's see, things to sh talk about, show off. Well, with the mantids, I received five species this week, Hymenopus coronatus, uh, Pseudocreobotra walbergii, Pseudovades chlorophia, brain is trying to think of the other things. I haven't internalized Latin for these new ones because I hadn't heard of them until I got them. Uh, Terracodula pantherina, panther praying mantis. Um, yeah, panther mantids, I really, really, really like those uh, because they're very roachy, and I didn't know they existed until I was offered them. So, Terracodula, 
Pantherina, Panther Mantids, uh, Pseudocreobotra walbergii, Pseudovates chlorophia, or is it Phylovates? Do do do. Pseudovates chlorophia. Texas unicorn mantids. Yeah, I was very excited about getting those again. The last time I had them was 2009. Been a very long time. I like that they're just. They're like a mantid that just doesn't like half ass it with trying to be a stick. It's just like full on just a stick with a body, basically. And I really like that. Um, and then the seller was kind enough to send me some ant mantids, which I'm going to have to look that up. Ant mantid. What the Latin is for Odontomantis planiceps. Uh, another, another organism that has um, mimicry with ants. And upon opening up the enclosure, uh, the, the cup to feed them, I realized that they also have most of these ant mimic things not, not only mimic ants, you know, physically, but behaviorally. And they just shot out of the container. <laughs> so, and it's very similar to Hemithrosostra when they're tiny. I mean, it's just like baby Hemithrosostra vitata may be one of the best ant mimics all around, both aesthetically and behaviorally. They just look, you would never know that they're a cockroach from looking at the first instar. You know, they even have, they even hold their like abdomen straight up like, like some ants do when they're foraging. Some eggs, are glow spots hard to keep? I used to think glow spots were kind of difficult. Uh, I think starting with a good number of them is important. Uh, a couple of times I had tried to start with just pairs back in the day where they were extremely rare and coveted and ex very expensive. I started with pairs a couple of times. They just never thrived. Um, and then when I was able to get a group of them, you know, like 20 ish individuals, it was very difficult to get them to stop breeding. Uh, and I think also their colonies are very prone to, to, uh, crashing if they aren't they're, they're very easy to maintain you can keep them going by just throwing handfuls of dog food blah 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 in but if the colony crashes and you have mostly adults or something like that you may just completely lose the colony and not be able to get any more reproduction or if you do get some reproduction it's going to be a while before you get the colony momentum going again uh, I would recommend if you're looking at the three glow spots, the easiest one to keep is the varicosa. There are plenty of people who just have bins full of them. They're very, they're very forgiving. Subkinta has been the same in my experience, uh, but it seems more people have problems getting subkinta going than varicosa. And of course, gross eye is the most difficult for whatever reason, which is why when I restarted my colony, I bought as many as I possibly could from the, the seller and threw them into a container. Now, hopefully there's going to be a baby apocalypse pretty soon, which would be very nice. And I get it to hopefully get them to the point like my other Luki Hormeticas where I don't have to worry about feed, feeding them a proper diet or taking care of them regularly. They just do it all on their own, hopefully. So they have their neat roaches. Could I live without them? I don't think so. <laughs> I was just thinking about, you know, I think about like so many things we have around that are readily available now that we take for granted in terms of like bug species, like going back to 2010, it's very difficult. We, we didn't even have a, a fraction of this. We maybe had like 40, 50 species in circulation, maybe even barely 50 species. Unfortunately, roaches, for, roaches, unlike some other things, people who get a colony going consistently can produce them and make them available. But not everybody has all 100 species or whatever, something that's available. So it's a matter of finding one person here, one person there to get different things, or at least, you know, it used to be more like that. Um, but, I mean, yeah, the spots are cool. They're really cool. 
is you need to change them with carrots and watch them go from yellow to, to orange. So, but it's definitely, you know, going back to the memory lane, blabbrush.com and seeing the one crappy picture of the Luki Hormetica subkincta with the saturation or whatever the brightness turned up and really made the spots pop. It was just, ooh, really cool. So, um, yeah, if you're on the fence about getting them and you, like I said, you go with Varicosa, you really can't go wrong. They're very hardy and very, uh, very easy all around, I think. So, look around nervously for anything else to show off. Um, a lot of good stuff up there waiting to come to fruition. I think, you know, maybe as bribery to get some more people on the live stream next week, I will show off the Pseudoglomerus Magnifica Cuck Fuong. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. If anybody here speaks Vietnamese, let me know. Cuck Fuong is how you – oh, I know you have written on there. But, um, yeah, I may show those off. Will you feed them to make their spots yellow? Some eggs, their spots are naturally yellow. Uh, when you feed them carrots or things that are rich in carotenoids, the tissue underneath, so there's the the exoskeleton, and then there's the soft tissues that are underneath it. And with the glow spots, the exoskeleton in that where the spot is is clear, see through, and also very thin. And the tissue underneath it is um, what what is giving that yellow color. And so uh, when you feed them carrots, most insects, their exoskeleton will not change colors when they're adults since it's, you know, the cells are hardened, sclerotized, and they, they don't have the ability to alter that like you can with pigments. There's not like actively changeable pigments in there. And so to be able to change colors for an adult insect, there have to be some very unique, very intricate um processes which is why things like the horse lover lover grass hop just as a one example you know instead of changing to a bright pink warning color they have the hind wings that are that color because it, it, it's the it was the path of least resistance in adapting that sort of signal was to change the hind wing color of an adult to be permanent and then be exposable then to have some sort of mechanism that changes the whole body color uh, so, but tortoise beetles can do it, but they have a very complex structural mechanism to change their color and they can change color one way very quickly, but getting back to their original resting coloration takes time. So where I was going with this is that the soft tissues underneath the spot on the glow spot are what give it its color. And so if you feed them more carotenoids, they accumulate more carotenoids in their system and those spots will turn orange. So Edward Coffee. I have Doobie and Red Runner Roaches. I'm looking into getting more roaches that can't climb or fly. I've looked at oranges and dice cards. Murray, if you had any recommendations. Um, you know, I, I depends on what you want. Do you want feeders? Do you want pets? Uh, for other non-climbing, non-flying stuff, especially things I have available right now, Blabber's Cranny for uh, Death's Head Roaches. Very cool. Very easy. Uh, a classic. Uh... Blabberus parabolicus, if you're looking for a pet, because they are they're like discoids but larger. Uh, there's a lot of options uh, for species if you include pets in there, but you know, can't go wrong with orange heads and pure discoids. Uh, and Bursatria, yeah, we have the four different uh, species slash varieties of Bursatria available. Um, and Bursatria can be used as pets. Uh, Fumigata variety Pallida has been historically used as a feeder. So, and I mean, all of them can be used as feeders as they're not toxic or anything like that. So you can have a nice looking, especially if you go with something like Bursatria Cabrera Eye, something that's a very nice looking roach that can also double as a feeder if you need to. So... Um, getting back to some things I'd like to do with the stream since we're going over a little on time right now, maybe do, maybe I might do a giveaway next week. I don't know how that works. I don't know if I say like, Hey, first person to reply in chat, uh, about this gets a colony of whatever. Uh, but I think I might, I'm going to start doing that. It'll drive up some interest in the, in the chat and 
although I'm not really looking for this to become the, the, the next big thing, it's nice to have more people. It's nice to have people in the chat talking about stuff. And it's also nice to uh, draw people out of the woodwork who may have things that all of us would like shared, uh, like new roach species and blah, 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 or husbandry techniques and whatnot. So with that being said, I think we're going to wrap up the stream for this week, do a random number generator. Yeah, see, like I said, I'm not the best with uh, technology per se. I mean, like, I, I troubleshooted and solved my webcam issue, which was apparently a very obscure problem. But, like, I, you know, I have to look around and figure out how to how to do such a thing. But, yeah, maybe in the next stream I'll, I'll do something like that. So each viewer, like her number, and then choose a random number. Yeah, that seems pretty simple and straightforward. I do like having things that have direct active engagement though, because it encourages people to join the stream and wait around or to savor and discuss blah, blah, blah until uh, some arbitrarily decided point where um, the giveaway can happen. So, but to everybody who's here, spread the word. I'll probably do some sort of giveaway next week. have no idea what it'll be. Um, some things that are sort of churning around in my head because they're things that people like and that I have a fair number of them on hand. Uh, Gravid female Thidipus regius, uh, some orchid mantids, some uh, domino roaches, or maybe some extinct roaches. I don't know. Could be something like that. Could be something else. Have to stay tuned. Spread the word. And with that being said, good night, everybody. Uh, may your bugs be ever bountiful. And I will see you all next week.